Okay, so this is my first look at uh, Heads of State. This is uh, Z-Men Games. And I keep picking up things by Z-Men Games because I think I bought a couple of things that I really, really liked. And I'm beginning to realize, no, they're... They might do some interesting games, but they also they primarily are about the components and the little wooden pieces and glossy rules that are, you know... <laughs> Uh, and that they don't have some design philosophy here that's really cool. What they have is, you know, an idea as a business that these games sell. So I'll put some on. Uh, anyway, this falls into that latter category for me from this readover of the rules. First of all, these rules are terrible. Um, they start out especially bad and they do get better but the first couple of pages is kind of this you don't have a real feel for what the game is about it's telling you do these mechanical things and without going into enough detail to give you the meat to understand but they're also not giving you a hey here's what you're trying to do in the game and the, here's what you're trying to do in the game is, well, it's a Euro, so you're trying to run around this racetrack and go as far as you can. Uh, but you get your points by placing nobles on the board and to some extent by maintaining your position on the board. And that's it. That's what the game is about. It's about collecting little wooden pieces. Uh, and these are all scoring pieces. They serve no other purpose in the game the whole game could probably <coughs> be played without almost any components at all. <laughs> but, that's fine. I don't mind the visual. There doesn't seem to be any graphical... There doesn't seem to be any requirement uh, for the geography, except that countries are separated, you know, for scoring values. There's very little here to warrant all these components. Okay. Still, there might be an interesting game beneath here, and I haven't played it yet, so I can't be certain. So let's start go looking at what the rules are, and then we'll start applying. Uh, the game's broken into and <laughs> three scoring rounds, essentially. And you start in the first play of the game there's some limitations on how you can play on the very on your very first card play. And proceed through. Once this deck runs out, you remove this token. That's a nice paperweight or whatever. That's all it seems to serve. And go through that little tiny deck of 11 cards. In that deck, one, 10 of the cards are just like all the rest. But one of them is the revolution card. And when you draw the revolution card, you score. And then you reshuffle all the decks and start the game all over again. <laughs> From the current position. Actually, you don't start all over again. You pick up where you are. Uh, but, so everything stays the same. The decks are reshuffled. Some scoring has been done. Scoring is done at other times, too, though. So when it's your turn, you basically can do one of two things. Uh, and let me deal some cards out because the game's going to start with these cards out. At the beginning of the game, there's going to be a pool of these attribute cards, and it's going to be tough to fit them all there. <laughs> Gotta do some sort of shifting. Uh, I've got some extra space over here, so this is. Well, that's going to be kind of annoying, actually. Hmm. Let me just... Yeah, this is great. I know. Um, so there's going to be a pool of six of these available. Some of them on the floor. Uh, and you need these to build your nobles, okay? So to play a baron on the board, you need a gold. 
And the little marker here says you can't use a courtesan. Courtesans are wild cards. They can be used in place of any other card except for, for the Baron, who's pretty simple, and for the King, who's very, very difficult to get. So, this is a set of available cards, and on the very first turn, depending on the number of players, you're not allowed to draw as many cards as you normally would. Normally on an attribute, on the attribute option, which is one of two things you can do on a turn, you would be able to either take three cards, and they can either be from the pool or from the top of the deck, or flush the deck, which means these six go out of play and six new ones come up. You're allowed to take one card, again, from either the uh, new pool or from the top of the deck, and then you reshuffle the flushed cards back into this deck. The one restriction on flushing, you can't uh, flush cards if it would break into the revolution deck. Those have to be done one at a time. All right, and once you draw the amount of cards that you're allowed, which is either going to be th three or one on most turns, but again, on the first turn, you're allowed limited draws. So in the five-player game, the first two players only get one card each. Uh, the second and third get two, or, or actually, the third and fourth get two, and the fifth gets three. Okay. Once you have those cards, you can meld them in order to create nobles. And let's say I had a gold, if I discard that, and there'll be a discard pile here, I can play a baron, and I can play him in any empty space. Whoop, whoop, whoop. When I do that, I could immediately start scoring some things. So, the first person to play in a space gets the hexagon tile, and they put that over there and move it on the racetrack and whatever. Uh, and that's a part of your scoring, and that's it. There are uh, some other pieces to the scoring, however, which is if you have, if you're able to get to have built someone, well, I'll go through the rest of the scoring in a moment. Let's go back to the, so, but that's why you want to do that, right? You want to build things because that's how you're going to score. You're going to score off your nobles there. Okay, so, and yeah, I apologize. It's a new game for me, and I'm not, not great with explaining the rules when I don't really understand them fully, but I think I, I thought I understood these well. Okay, so the second option is the treachery option. And there you draw one of these cards. And I wish I had more space. <sighs> Move these over. Put them up here. There are two of these in the pool. The sole purpose of these cards is to destroy other players' nobles. And one Assassin card allows you to destroy a noble anywhere on the board except in capital spaces, which have kind of a frame around them. Two assassin cards allow you to try to destroy someone in a capital space. There are also special country cards. So, for example, this one is the Inquisition. Actually, it looks like it's a dual country. I think that's an Inquisition and a Headsman, yeah, uh, which means it doesn't state the other country that it affects, but it's in red, so you can kind of tell. So that's a special card that can only be used in Spain or England. Now, they work pretty much the same as an Assassin, except you can only use it in the countries listed. So they're a less valuable card. Uh, you can't pair it with assassins, but if you had two uh, inquisitions, you could take out the king in Spain. Okay.
Am I correct? Yes. So there's a mechanism which is hideous for handling these treachery cards. Um, and I gotta look at this. What you do is you end up putting your three cubes in a bag and the opposing player puts one in the bag and you shake this bag up. Oh, that sounds like lots of fun to me. And draw one out and wonderfully random too. I am going to be using a die for this. <laughs> I don't know if I, I don't think I have a four sider available, so it's going to be kind of annoying there, but the idea of having to deal with a bag of uh, cubes when it's constantly only holding that same exact mixture three to one in every single instance <laughs> makes no sense. There's no reason to include this stupid mechanism in here. Just Give me a four-sided die. <laughs> uh, the only good thing I can say about it is there's no, you know, choosing. I hate rock, paper, scissors type games. Uh, and this avoids that. But this has to be one of the clunkiest mechanisms I've ever seen. The reason for being opposed to rock, paper, scissors is it doesn't work well solitaire. My brain gets confused. and I always throw a rock at myself and punch myself in the jaw. Okay. So let's go back to the scoring. We already explained one of the things. The first person in an area gets this chip. Now these chips aren't all the same value. The more important the area, I'm guessing, <laughs> well, at least the capitals, and probably the more expensive, the cheapest noble, the more points you get from getting it. These are my guesses. I'm not really doing a lot of analysis on this. Country scoring markers. That's these guys. Well, when you create a noble, you put a chip on the board, but you also get a card indicating, I created that noble. Those cards will be valuable later in the game. Uh, you keep them forever. They just say, I had a noble of this type at some point, and you can have multiple of the same type. They're just scoring markers. Uh, okay. How do you get one of these square markers? Well, if you're the first person who's been, who's created a noble in every area, you get the first one of those. And if you're the second one, you get the second one of those. This includes dead nobles. So for example, I don't know, if you've got this guy here, and maybe you collected this, and he gets killed, he gets flipped over, and there's an indication that I had a black noble created in this space. And that will mean, now as soon as the country is scored for me, I can remove that, or once all the the big squares are gone, I guess I can remove it. Uh, but it's just a way of keeping track of, I once had rulership in this area. Okay. So that's another scoring uh, mechanism there, and you're only allowed to do that once per country, so basically two different players are guaranteed to get those points. Noble house scoring, that's this set here. Once you have created at least one of each type, you get the highest value, one of these, that's left. So the first three players to have created one of each kind of noble, and you'll have a card for each of them, uh, will be able to collect some more points, whatever these points are. Yeah, you know, there's some sort of I have this much noble blood in my history or something, I don't know, because it doesn't have anything to do, there's no real board positioning in any of these. Okay, but now we go to the one that is, which is at the end of the turn. When the revolution comes up, we've got three of these scoring phases. Well, these are special scoring in which uh, you score each country based on how much influence each player has. Now, the influence is... Let's see what the, I didn't actually look at the specifics for this. Each uh, live noble scores dependent on rank and location in a province. If a noble is present, he gets two, and if two are present, the higher noble gets two and the lower one. Gotcha. So, here we have two nobles, uh, a count and an earl. The earl is higher. He would get two points if he's present. 
the count would get one if he's present. If they're both the same person, you get all those points. Now this is just a total that you're collecting. These aren't victory points, okay? Uh, in the capital, one noble will get you four, if that's all that's present. But if two are present, it's four and two. So again, where there's a king and a prince that are important, you can share the points or score more by having both. Now, whoever has the most influence in the country gets the higher valued disc as real victory points. Whoever has the second most gets the lower valued disc. In some places, there's a lot of variance compared to others. So in France, highest influence is very important. But we look in Spain or Germany especially, and being second isn't so bad. Interesting dynamics and thoughts to go into your strategy there. Uh, what else do we get here? I think that's it. And is there, yeah, at the end of the game, there's one last, so there's the 1789 scoring phase. There's one last piece to all of it at the end of the game, which is if you have the most of a particular type of card that you've produced in the game, you get a big pile of points for that, for whatever reason. <laughs> so what you're trying to do here looks like you're trying to rule some noble, some noble um, family or you're trying to get them to rule the most territory over time. And the only real influence here is, hmm, what cards you can pick. Okay, that sounds exciting. Um, yeah, I mean, there's not a lot to the game to tie it to its, its theme. Uh, it seems very limited on that, but it may still tell an interesting story and that's sort of my last hope here is, okay, just because the mechanisms don't necessarily link in well with the theme, the theme still may be interesting, but here's the problem. This game could be purely abstract. Now, it would interest me not at all if it was, but I'm not sure that there are players who really, really like this who are terribly interested in the theme. <laughs> Yet they still would not want this totally abstract, I would guess. Uh, uh, games with themes seem to sell better. And I don't understand that. I never will. <laughs> Um, the abstract mechanism doesn't excite me that much. The theme did. I went and bought a used copy of it, and now I recoil away and say, well, how exactly does this link? I mean, what is up? Yes, I understand gold and, and, and titles and skills, and these things are important to making a marquee, but I'm just drawing cards. I could be playing Go Fish, you know? <laughs> That's my worry with this kind of game, and... That's why I look and I, I say the theme, the components, these all th seem very secondary to what was essentially a design. And this is different from, say, a war game where, to tell you the truth, the design is probably secondary. And in some cases it's not. But usually the design, I think, is secondary to what am I portraying here? Well, here it seemed like I have this kind of cute idea, and it may have come up with the theme linked to it directly, but in the end, it, it, it seems completely uh, unimportant. You know, uh, the mechanism is not clearly linked. All right. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna give this a shot. See what happens, and it may start convincing me that I've got a start selling games rather than buying ones. <laughs>